Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Torres and I'm the host of the Storytime Guy podcast. Join me for a weekly discussion about all things pop and geek culture. When you tune in, you'll hear me talking movies, TV, books, comics, gaming, with an extra emphasis on Latino representation and pop culture, anything in the horror genre, and if it's got superheroes, I'm talking about it. Sometimes with an amazing group of guests. Whether you're an expert or new to any of those things, I guarantee you're going to have a good time. It's April 27th, and today on the show, we're reading from the Necronomicon to discuss Evil Dead Rise. Then I throw on some Beskar armor to give you my review of The Mandalorian Season 3. And finally, we're discussing Aztec mythology and the epic story of the Five Sons. It's story time. So we're starting off the show with Evil Dead Rise. It came out last week. I'm going to do non-spoilers first, and then we'll jump into the spoilers ahead of time. So you guys can kind of get a dip, a, you know, a gist of, do you want to hear this? Do you not want to hear this? when it comes to the movie. So, for those who don't know, Evil Dead Rise is the fifth movie in the Evil Dead franchise. It's been going on since, I believe, the 80s. Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness. Then they rebooted it in 2013 and just called it Evil Dead. And then they made a TV show that was a continuation from Army of Darkness, which is the third film. And at this point, you're like, okay, what? it's horror movies, man. How many times horror movies get rebooted, remade, reconnected? Who knows? At the end of the day, do you need to watch any single Evil Dead anythings before you watch Evil Dead Rise? No. Evil Dead Rise is a standalone movie. There's a little bit of Easter eggs and cameos and this and that for fans of the Evil Dead franchise. But as a whole, no, you can just watch Evil Dead Rise without any connection or kind of knowledge of the Evil Dead franchise, which I think is both a good thing and a bad thing. So when it comes to Evil Dead Rise... I think it's really cool. It's really gory. I love Deadites. Those are the demon names that for people that possess people. Um, and I think it's really cool. They they didn't set this in a cabin in the woods. They set it in a hotel or a, like an apartment complex in Los Angeles. It's this really, really cool kind of um, new setting, kind of reinventing the old, but keeping keeping the thing that made you love it, right? Evil Dead, monsters, gore. It's got all of that. I think my problem comes from the fact that at times, this movie doesn't know what it wants to be. So for those of you that, that don't know Evil Dead, Evil Dead is both a comedy and a horror. Everything that they've done that's scary, they've also done silly things. You know, in Evil Dead 2, there's this iconic scene where the main character, Ash, is like absolutely going ban banana bononkers and... Bononkers. Yep, it's a word now. <laughs> banana bonkers. And the, the, the lamp starts laughing. The chair starts laughing. The, you know, all these like dish plates and everything's like, <laughs> and it's him going absolutely crazy. It's ridiculous, funny, scary, but, you know, overall a pretty humorous scene. With Evil Dead Rise, we don't really get that. We, we get like references to those things, but for the most part, they take this movie pretty seriously. And I think that's where they failed as far as I'm concerned. I enjoyed this movie, and I think if you like Evil Dead, you want to watch a horror movie, go watch this, you'll enjoy it. But I can just say off me and off the audience I was with, when that movie ended, no one applauded, no one did or said anything. One guy in the theater went, well, that was a movie, and everyone laughed, and that was, and then everyone walked out. Didn't bother Frank credits, didn't bother to stay there for more than 30 seconds, right? And I think that's the problem, that if you're an Evil Dead fan, you're going into this going, oh, we're getting another Evil Dead. Not really. Uh, Evil Dead really is just this kind of uh, comedy horror, and we didn't get that with this movie. There is a scene, minor spoiler, where someone gets an eyeball shot into their mouth. If you're an Evil Dead fan, you know this, that that's always happened almost every single movie. And in every other movie, you're like, oh, silly. But in this one, it kind of just takes you out of it. You're like, wait, I thought this was supposed to be a serious kind of a uh, movie, a serious, there was, was like a real gritty take on it. And for that scene to happen, you're just like, uh, didn't fit. Didn't fit the aesthetic of what's going on here, right? So that's the, that's the kind of my complaint about the movie. Now, the good, the acting is so wonderful. The characters in this are wonderful. The actress in this is wonderful. Uh, every actor is nailing this movie. The main character, the, the groupie, I'm not a groupie, but she's a groupie rock star. Um, she's wonderful. She's not really fleshed out. And that's kind of the bigger problem is a lot of these characters aren't fleshed out. Um, a lot of times with horror movies, you kind of give a, give a little bit and then kind of save them, explain more about them as the movie goes on. This one, they don't do that. You, you don't really find out anything about any of these characters. Um, and so, yeah, you're like, you can't really connect to these characters. So when, spoiler, when a lot of characters start dying, you don't really feel 
that attached to them, right? That's kind of the, the, the good, the bad. You have these amazing actors who are doing these amazing character works and this amazing, you know, they're like acting the hell out of the scenes, but the script doesn't give them enough to work with. So it's one of those, it's a good and a bad thing, you know? Uh, another good thing that really, there's no negative to this, but there sort of is, um, the gore, the violence, the horror, my God. God, this movie knows how to do it. It knows how to do horror right. It knows how to do horror correctly. It is so, not scary, but man, it's good. It's just, it's, there's scenes where like people get impaled, people get chainsawed. And still having said that, um, there's no kills in this that are revolutionary. There's no kills in this that were going to go down in history as like, dang, that was a sick way to die or get killed. We don't really get that in this movie. Um, there's no like dismemberment really, which is if you're an Evil Dead fan, you're gonna be like, wait, no one gets dismembered? Not really. Even when they do, it's towards the end of the movie and it's kind of not really dismemberment. So, you know, there's kind of things that you want as an Evil Dead fan and I'm an Evil Dead fan. I love Evil Dead. I watch all the movies. Evil Dead 2 is one of my favorite movies, not even horror movies, just movies in general, period. But yeah, you get kind of disappointed. You're like, where's where's the heads flying all over the place? Where's people getting their arms cut off? You know, like every character's got to get the hand cut off, right? We don't get that in this. Ah, disappointment. That's the good. That's the bad. And look, I'll say this when it comes to gore. If you're going to give me gore, if you're going to do Evil Dead, a, a franchise that is notorious for practical effects horror, you got to give me practical effects when it comes to the kills, man. This movie egregiously made some CGI decisions when they're like, we're going to kill someone through CGI. Man, no, nah, I don't, you're missing me with that. Like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't think fans of Evil Dead like it. I don't think horror fans like it in general. Stop doing CGI blood. Stop doing just, if it's going to be a kill, you got to do practical. We expect that nowadays. It, it, this is not an indie movie. You got to give us that practical effects. You got to give us good practical effects. I'm going to say that I enjoyed this movie. Once again, watch it. But I will say that this movie does something that astounded me. It drags. It is a slow movie. Even when, like, the action picks up, it still slows down. There's this movie called Sick They came out about these two girls that are in a cabin and the serial killer goes after them. They wait 10 minutes and it is balls to the walls crazy for an hour straight. It's wild. They don't slow down. This movie doesn't have that. It, it, it picks up, it goes down. It picks up, it goes down. It picks up, it goes down over and over again, which isn't the worst problem. But when it goes down, it goes really down. And when it goes up, it doesn't go that high up. And the worst part about all of this, the movie's an hour and a half long. An hour and a half. What, what were they thinking? A slow movie, a horror movie that's only an hour and a half, and you're not balls to the walls after 10 minutes? It takes like 25 minutes to set this movie up. Way too long for a horror movie. Honestly, I feel like it's closer to 30 minutes before anything actually happens. And then when things do happen, they, they go down and they go up, and they go down and they go up. And you're like, no, this is not how you do a horror movie. So that's what I got to say about Evil Dead Rise. I'm sorry. I was going into this so happy. But no, it's entertaining. Um, maybe Maybe you'll get something out of it. I just couldn't get more from this movie. I wish I could, and I've heard other people and other people talk about, oh, this movie is this, and, but as someone who watches a lot of horror movies, I gotta say, the kills weren't that great, the the story wasn't that good, and I just feel like, look, if you're not gonna make an Evil Dead movie, don't make an Evil Dead movie, okay? If you're gonna make a very serious, grimy, dark horror movie, then make that, okay? This wasn't that, though. It almost was, but it wasn't. Alternatively, if you want to make an Evil Dead movie, then make an Evil Dead movie, okay? Be, we don't always need this ultra-violence like, like the Evil Dead 2013 movie was, right? We can get a movie where it's good and funny and violent. People like that, especially horror fans. We're fucked up in the head, and we like seeing a little laughter with our murder, right? All in all... You can go see Evil Dead Rise. It's still in theaters. You might enjoy it. I gotta say, though, if you're trying to save a buck and you're like, um, maybe wait for this to come to streaming. Uh, it's just not one of those movies that you need to see in theaters, unfortunately. And I'm always one of those people that says, go watch this in theaters. But I gotta say, for this one, <sighs> it kind of fell flat. And that's my review for Evil Dead Rise. I'm sorry it couldn't rise up to my expectations. I apologize for that pun, but this movie deserves that pun because I was disappointed. The Mandalorian season three was great, but it could have been better. And I think that's a collective agreement among everyone who's watched the season three. So 
If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's been out for a week, and I'm sorry, look, I got a podcast to run. I got to talk about these things, and there's only so much non-spoiler stuff I can talk about, especially when it's Star Wars, when it's The Mandalorian. So I'm going to start with a lot of spoilers right off the bat. I'm giving you a warning. Skip forward 10 minutes if you don't want to hear this, okay? Three, two, one. I can't believe The Mandalorian died. No, I'm kidding. He didn't die. Um... But yeah, so let's we're gonna jump into the finale, right? Um, I feel like that's the most to talk about. This whole season has been building up to the Mandalorians retaking Mandalore, right? And it, we we kind of got to that point. And I will say, some fans, myself included, kind of were like, "Oh, is it gonna go this way? It's gonna go this way." And at the end of the day, it kind of just went in a straight line, and we got exactly what we wanted. Now, the highlights of this are. Mandalorian War. Oh my god, we've never really got that. We definitely never got that in live action. We kind of got it in the Clone Wars TV show, but not to this capacity, not this badassness. Oh my god, Bo Katan Kreese takes the dark saber. She goes after. Now, unfortunately, there's not any elite units for her to fight at the beginning of the war. She's kind of just mowing down nameless goons. Whatever. I get it. Would have been cool to have like her fight Moff Gideon and that kind of like both of them leading their forces. This actually being like you know, a, a battle instead of just like ah, flying at each other, hitting each other, whatever. Now, I will say I've noticed a lot of people haven't talked about it, but other than Mando, the three main characters in that fight scene were all women and they were all getting their, their flowers for doing all the stuff, which once again, we got that in season two. We're getting that in season three. The three main characters of this of this air battle was the armorer was Bo-Katan and it was Bo-Katan's best friend played by Sasha Banks, former wrestler. Um, and they're wonderful. I, I feel like a lot of people don't talk about that, that like we get like badass women once again um, doing badass fight scenes. Now, outside of that, we get Grogu fighting the Praetorian Guard. Super sick. You might remember them from episode eight. The Praetorian Guards, there was, I think, nine or seven of them that fought Kylo Ren and Rey. And it's like I, to me, I still stand by. That's one of the coolest fight scenes we've ever gotten in Star Wars. And we get something similar in this one. Now, is the fight scene with them great? No, I don't think it even comes close to episode eight's battle. They're kind of just like trying to kill a little jumpy baby. That's, <laughs> you know, that's Grogu's jumping around. They're trying to kill Grogu and he's laughing a little bit. He's like, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I get it. Um, Mando goes toe to toe with Moff Gideon. It's 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 a pretty cool fight. I feel like Mando, he doesn't have the smoke in the air from beneath his cape kind of thing. And that's to say, like, He's not overshadowed by anyone, but he definitely doesn't do anything that's like really highlighted, really cool. He just has a good fight scene. It's good. It's not the greatest, but it's good. Um, Moff Gideon is in this mecha suit that's like has brief references with the little spikes on the top. And you're like, is it spiky because he's evil or spiky because Darth Maul? Like, what's what's the connection here? He's got a robot suit on. It's made of Beskar. He's got a Praetorian weapon. That's pretty much a lightsaber. Dude is going to go to town, right? Now, I think this leads to my biggest complaint about the season finale, okay? And I, I get it. Fan service is not always something needed. But I will say that when Luke Skywalker showed up in season two of The Mandalorian, everyone lost their cool and it broke the internet. So for no fan service to be in this episode, okay. For no fan service to be in this really entire season, okay. Yes, we get the one, I always forget his name. We get a character from Rebels. He shows up and makes a brief cameo. That's cool. But we really, we really don't get any actual fan service, any connections. Ahsoka really doesn't show up or do anything. Um, so it kind of feels like a wasted opportunity. And I think the biggest wasted opportunity for me is, and this could change because they could still go forward with this, but in episode seven so the the see the, the episode before the season finale moff gideon's like i am creating a beskar armor wielding force using like super genius version of myself that'll wield the you know he's like he's it's describing this like fanboy's wet dream you're like a, a mandalorian jedi who's evil with a robot suit yes that's moff gideon clone yes please and then we don't get that could we get that down the road Maybe, but do we get it now? No. And I'm like, I feel like that was kind of the, that's kind of the disappointment for me. I'm like, you just described something I would love to see. And yet you're not giving it to me. Disappointment. <laughs> Look, I'm saying it's a great episode. Could it have been better? Sure, but it's still a great episode. Having said that, this does lead me to a point that I want to bring up, that I want to discuss when it comes to Star Wars. So for those of you who don't know, they announced at Star Wars Celebration that they are doing three Star Wars movies, okay? Uh, 
uh, Dave Filoni, who's currently the story co-story writer of The Mandalorian. He did Rebels, did Clone Wars TV show. Uh, he's getting his own movie. Great. Excited for him. He's not the best writer and director. He's more of an ideas guy. He's like, this is an ideas guy. When you let him full write something, when you let him full direct something, eh, <laughs> gets a little silly. He needs to be reeled in sometimes. They're doing a Ray Skywalker movie. Uh, which is, I'm, I love Ray. I love the character. I love sequels. Um, Ray Skywalker movie. Excited for it. Cool. I don't know if it's going to be episode 10. I don't know if it's going to be its own standalone movie. I don't know if it's going to be the beginning of a series. But she's getting her own movie where she's starting a Jedi Academy. It takes place 15 years after episode 9. Which makes me wonder, like, why'd she wait 9 years to start a Jedi Academy? Or 15 years to start a Jedi Academy. Whatever. Um, I also will say this. Look. So they have, they announced the director for this movie, okay? She is a award-winning journalist, and that's wonderful. But, and when it comes to filmmaking, she's done nothing close to this budget, and now she's gonna be taking charge of a $200 million big blockbuster movie with no experience in film. And I feel like they're setting her up to fail. This just, it doesn't work. You can't, we've never seen it. Just plain and simple, I'm just gonna say it plain out. There has never been a man or a woman, regardless of anything, that's been able to, go from making indie, I'm saying like little tiny thousand dollar movies, whatever, to making a $200 million blockbuster movie. I think the only exception to that is Ryan Coogler, who still had made Fruitvale Station before he made Black Panther. So really when you're looking at it, one person, and you've got to argue Ryan Coogler is one of the greatest of all times, one person was able to be successful, and we see time and time again with the Marvel TV shows and the Marvel movies, these, these directors and writers who've never done anything great and big are being thrown into these movies and they're like here write the thing direct the whole damn thing do whatever you want they failed time and time again and i feel like ray is already one of those characters where you're you're, you're tiptoeing around her right some people love her some people hate her she's polarizing right and they have to be cognizant of that so this is your shot right this is your opportunity to 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 get the fans united, to create something that is a masterpiece, to really plan this story ahead of time, right? Instead, we're getting a, to be frank, a nobody director, who I'm sure might do a good job, but she's getting thrown into the deep end, and history shows that doesn't usually work for anyone. Then you have the story. They don't even have a, a writer, they've announced. There's behind the scenes of what's been going on. Apparently, Damon Lindelof wrote a script, and then they're like, eh, eh, eh. They took the script, he quit or got fired, and then they're having someone else either rewrite that script or write a new script, and they're currently working on that script, and yet they've already hired a director. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? You're setting this movie up to fail. If I, I get it. We want diversity. I want diversity when it comes to filmmaking. Bryce Dallas Howard's right there. She's right there. She's directed some of the best episodes of The Mandalorian. Why did you not let give her this movie? Why would you choose a nobody director over Bryce Alza, who is done, who is an Academy Award nominated actress? She is a wonderful director. Give This should have been her movie. I don't know why they gave it to anyone else. This should have been her movie. Whatever. Um, and then what's the final movie? Uh, oh, James Mangold. James Mangold, who did The Wolverine and Logan, two phenomenal movies. He is doing a Star Wars movie that takes place like thousands of years ago when like Jedi and Sith were just like starting out. It's like a really, really old ancient film. I'm pumped for that. And after he's doing that movie, he's jumping over to DC to do um, the Swamp Thing movie for James Gunn's new DC universe. So he's having a great old time. I'm excited for him. Uh, yeah. So right now, Star Wars is is all over the place. I love it. You know, is it silly sometimes? Sure. Jack Black, Lizzo, cameo in this TV show. What? Was it funny? Was it cool? Yes, cool. Um, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, Star Wars needs to be careful, though. They do have a very polarizing audience. The audience is half of them are psychopaths. The other half are reasonable people. And they need to be careful going forward. <sighs> at the end of the day, I'll say this. Mandalorian is a long TV show, so maybe we didn't get the lightsaber, Beskar, Mandalorian, jetpack, force users, whatever we got, right? But it was wonderful. We got Din, we got Din accepting and adopting Grogu, what a beautiful moment. Um, and I think going forward, we're gonna have a lot more of these stories. I don't think there's any plans to quit the Mandalorian TV show. I think it's gonna keep going until it keeps going. 
we're getting Thrawn in the Soka show, and that's great. But like the reference we got to him was good. I think what people need to remember is that yes, fan service is cool and I think it's needed sometimes, but at the end of the day, the story is the most important thing. And I think we got a good story. Not a great story, but a good solid story where we enjoyed this. Definitely a wonderful season of The Mandalorian. If you haven't seen it, you got it spoiled for you now. Still, I think you're going to enjoy the ride. Um, I really can't say, express how much I love this show, how much this show means to me, how much Star Wars has done for Latinos, especially, man. They've got like four shows and three of those shows are Latinos leads or a Latino behind the scenes. Book of Boba Fett had Robert Rodriguez. Mandalorian has Pedro Pascal. Ahsoka um, show has Rosario Dawson. And then Andor had um, Diego Luna. Once again, Fantastic cast, fantastic crew, wonderful Latino characters, wonderful Latino actors. I love it. I love seeing this. As for Mandalorian, my only complaint, I don't really have one. I just kind of, uh, I would have liked to see, who wouldn't like to see like super space Mando armor Jesus force user fight, you know? <laughs> Anyways, I give The Mandalorian a solid four out of five. It's a great show. I think you're going to enjoy it. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. If you did watch it, hit me up. Message me on social media. Tell me what you thought about it. I'll do a video later talking and discussing this. But for the podcast users, message me. Tell me what you thought of it. We'll have good discussions on it. If you love Aztec mythology, which if you follow me, I know you do, you're going to love this next bit. I'm going to be telling you the epic, big, this is the big epic story of Aztec mythology. It's called the five suns. Sun spelled S-U-N-S, like the sun in the sky. Now, it features many gods, violence, war, backstabbing, giant monsters, people get dismembered, it's gory, it's violent, it's beautiful, has one of the greatest underdog stories in it. Oh my god, it has a, uh, well, this underdog story is actually one of my most viewed videos on TikTok, so you know it's going to be entertaining, but let me, before I begin, let me give a kind of disclaimer, right? When it comes to Aztec mythology, when it comes to Mesoamerican history, a lot of it's been changed, erased, deleted, um, updated, right? There's all these different things we're discovering. And because it was so like, hold on to what you got, grab a book in history and write it down. History is going to vary, right? This story is how I read it. And I can tell you, I've read it. I've read multiple books, been talked to by indigenous people, and almost everything says something differently. So if you've heard this story, it might be different than the one I'm about to tell you. I took a little bit of, oh, I, I like that version of it, and I like this version of it, and that version of it. So I'm kind of piecing together it myself of how this makes sense. Having said that, everyone's going to have their own version of this. So if you're listening going, this guy, this, I heard something differently. Yeah, you probably did. Okay, Latinos, our indigenous side, our history of it is very vague. It was ruined. It was destroyed. We are trying to piece it back together. Um, and so that's what I'm doing here. So just a disclaimer, if you hear this or you tell this, someone's like, that's not what I heard. That's OK. Latinos, we all have different varieties, and that's what makes us wonderful and unique. So without further ado, let's get to the story of the Aztec mythology is a big epic, the five sons. Now, the Five Sons is a historical event of how the world was created. It's a long-winded version of going, and this is how the Earth was made. So before the Earth was made, there was a uh, this powerful being called Ometiot. It means the dual god. It is um, he is a powerful being, or he and she. So it is uh, it is both. It is the the Ometiot is half a woman, half a man. Now, you can interpret that any way you want. Some people interpret it, it is, it is uh, a being that goes from a man to a woman to a man. Uh, some people interpret it as literally just a couple, and they just are like, we love each other so much, we're going to share a name. Other people do it as that's a, it's a hermaphroditic being. It, it's up in the air, right? At the end of the day, Omatiot is this powerful being. It is the creator, but not the ruler. So Omatiot creates this gigantic pantheon of gods, right? And part of that creation is letting them determine what they want to do when it comes to ruling. So, uh, Ometeot puts Tezcatipoca in charge. Tezcatipoca is Loki bumped to 11. This man is psychotic. He's ruthless. He is mean. He has the most stories written about him because he is absolutely brutal. His name means the smoking mirror. And that's to say that his uh, he carries a, an obsidian mirror with him that can see the future. He can control magic. He's the god of magic. He's the god of knights. He's the god of darkness. He's the god of masculinity. He's the goddess of like war. One of the gods of war. He is all these gods of all these things, which is to say, when I tell you he became the first king, 
you have to understand why, right? So he's really powerful. He's one of the four gods of the wind. Incredible, right? I'm gonna, so Tezcatipoca, really cool dude, very violent. If you've ever seen pictures of a god with, um, he paints himself black and he has a yellow stripe across his face. That's Tezcatipoca. You ever see the jaguar? That's his god. That's his patron. He's the jaguar. He's the skunk. He's the monkey. He's the traitor, the trickster, the, the villain. So he's the first ruler of the first son. <laughs> and he's such an interesting person because he strongly believes that the world should be ruled pretty clenched tightly, right? So he creates this race of giants, these gigantic uh, people, right? And they rule across the earth and they're, they're praising and they're doing great, but they're a little lazy about it but because they're so big, their, their energy is very expendable very quickly. And so he finds that these giants aren't praising them as much as he wants them to. He's like, hey, I created you. I'm your god. Worship us gods. And the giants just aren't worshiping them the way he wants to. They're also not fighting each other because, like I said, they're, they're giants. They don't really expend that much energy that much. They eat, they sleep, they pray, repeat. So that's Kelty Polka is mad. And he starts punishing the giants very severely, very ruthlessly. And his brother gets out Kowak, the plumed serpent, the feathered serpent, everyone to say, the giant green snake you've seen with wings, that's Quetzalcoatl. He's Tezcatlipoca's brother. Uh, it's more of a metaphorical brother. They're not actually biologically related to each other. Um, yeah, that's a whole other thing. So uh, Quetzalcoatl, who's the god of winds, the god of justice, the god of hope, the god of peace. He doesn't believe in sacrifices. He believes in love and kindness. He's the god of chocolate. He's the nice guy, right? So he's the antithesis to Tetsuka Tipoko. So Quetzalcoatl's like, hey, Tetsuka, you need to chill out, man. Like, don't harm these guys. Don't do that. You're being too violent with them, right? Tetsuka Tipoko's like, hey, shove it, Quetzalcoatl. And <laughs> so Quetzalcoatl dethrones him. He's like, nah, I gave you a warning. You didn't listen. Now I'm going to kick your butt. And he he deposes uh, Tetsuka Tipoko. He knocks him off his throne. And a lot of people word it differently. But how I viewed it is that he knocked him into the ocean. Right? Because out of the ocean, Tezcatlipoca arises with an army of jaguars. It is one of the most cool, like, just close your eyes and think about this. A god who is angry, who's painted black, and the black is running down his face and his body, and he's pissed, and he's strong, and he's angry, and he's rising out of the water, and jaguars, hundreds of gigantic, bloodthirsty jaguars are following him to the shore, and he raises his hand and is like, end it, and his jaguars kill Everyone, they kill all the giants across the world. It is a violent and ruthless and mean. And Tezcatlipoca, you know, shouts up, if I can't rule, no one can. After which, he disappears. Well, Quetzalcoatl's in charge now, and he's like, well, that didn't really work out, so let me start again. So he creates the second sun. He creates his uh, a kind of like a reset button on the earth because um, it was destroyed, and in his... Um, ruling, he creates monkeys, or monkey-like people, right? So, um, he's having a good time being the ruler and everything. The monkeys aren't the best. They're a little too silly. They they kind of make jokes here and there. They don't take festivals and religion too seriously and sacrifices. But Quetzalcoatl's not really big on all of that. So he's like, it's cool. It's cool. We all right. The other gods are not happy with this, though. And it eventually leads to Quetzalcoatl really alienating himself from everyone. Uh, he is really this understanding, I love you guys, you know, it's all okay. The other gods are like, hey, I love yous aren't going to, you know, pay the bills. We need people to worship us. We need them to sacrifice blood. We need them to do these things, and they're not doing it. So with his kind of posse, his protectors not there, Atetzcatlipoca is able to sneak in, get close to Quetzalcoatl, and then dethrone him. And once again, Atetzcatlipoca is going to do what he's going to do. Not only does he dethrone Quetzalcoatl, he uses his own power to do it. So he he takes over. So he, I don't know how, you know, he, he at the end of the day, he, he pretty much imprisons Quetzalcoatl, but tells no one. No one's around to see it. Beats up Quetzalcoatl, takes him out in the middle of the night, and then he takes on, he shapeshifts into Quetzalcoatl, and then is like, hey, everyone, how would you like some wind? And he proceeds to use Quetzalcoatl's power of the wind to destroy the world. A gigantic tornado windstorm sweeps over the earth. Everyone's like, why Quetzalcoatl? We thought you loved us. <laughs> Crazy. Once again, Tatkatipoka, for the second time now, destroys the earth in an apocalypse. Well, 
going forward for the third son. It's not explained how or why. You can all take guesses on, you know, why or only maybe Omet the old stepped in. Regardless, Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl were banned. They were like, no, nah, y'all can't get involved in this. Don't do this. So Talak is elected the ruler of um, the third son. Talak is a the god of rain. He is violent. He is mean. He's possibly one of the strongest gods, but he's very ambivalent to everything and everyone. He's very much like, hey, leave me and my family alone. I'm just going to rule whatever. And he's the god of rain and thunder. And he wears this sick snake. It's a blue mask that looks like a snake. It's really, really cool. He looks awesome. He looks scary. Um, but he is violent and cruel. And one of the things that you should, to kind of give you the heads up on who Talak is, his preferred method of sacrifice was drowning people. Uh, he like, didn't matter if they were children, women, men, old, young. He was the drowner god. If you drowned, he was like, hey, appreciate you. You can go to my nice, cool little heaven in, you know, the sky. Um, but if you got to get sacrificed, you got to drown him, right? Which I feel like is both a messed up and an okay way to go out. Talak is the ruler, right? So... That's <laughs> I, I tell you, he's the, he's the he's the main character of this whole thing. That's Katipoka is like, hey, I can't fight Talak. He's stronger than me. I can't get in. I can't interfere because I'll get in trouble. So how do I depose Talak without directly deposing him? Well, Talak has a and it changes with every story. He has either a sister or a wife or a girlfriend or a combination of those. Um, I usually see it as a sister named Shalchi Utikwe. She's the goddess of oceans and waters, right? And she's the sweetest, nicest, you know, kind of a sort of goddess of love and fertility. Sweetheart, right? Tetsuketipo go flirts with her and he's like, hey, I can't fight you, Talak, but I'm not going to fight you because I'm going to be your brother-in-law. And they actually run away together. So um, at this point, the underworld is kind of, it exists now because people are dying. And so Talak and no gods actually have power in the underworld except for the gods of the underworld. So uh, <laughs> that's good. The book is like, interesting. No god has power in the underworld. And Talak would kill me if he saw that I was sleeping with his sister. So he and Shaochi Yutikwe sneak to the underworld to do their thing. <laughs> and if you're like, that sounds like Hades and uh, that one girl from Greek mythology. Yeah, it's actually a very similar story. So <laughs> Tesca de Focus, you know, messing around with Talak's sister and Talak loses his bananas. He's pissed when he finds out because he can't do anything. He knows he was that smart about Tesca Tipoca. He can't hurt Tesca Tipoca because he didn't do anything wrong. And he's like, he goes after the gods of the dead who are like, excuse you? No, no, no. You don't get to talk to me when you're in the underworld. Get out of here because they're not scared of him. So Talak's like absolutely furious. And he's like, you know what? Fuck it. And he like just ruins the world, just destroys the world. And I, they say uh, um, it was rain of fire, but it, it's pretty much like lightning. He like summoned a gigantic lightning storm that destroyed the world. And he's like, all right, deuces. <laughs> and he quits or is removed. Doesn't really say. And hey, if you enjoyed part one, tune in next week for the epic conclusion. Part two, we're going to continue the story of the five sons. Okay, everyone, I gotta go find a priest because my dog is floating in the air shouting that I'm gonna be dead by dawn. Hey, Gurky, keep it down. Daddy's making a podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. Don't forget to follow me on all the socials. I'm at the Storytime Guy. And as always, you'll be dead by dawn. <clears throat> Have a magical day, everyone.